Hello everybody and welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Deborah Hatswell and you're listening to BBR Investigations. Over the years, I have listened to, documented and shared thousands of personal reports from people who have seen impossible creatures or experienced strange, unexplained events. Many of those people I have spoken to over the years also have experiences with more than one kind of activity. Adult Bigfoot witnesses who go on to explain the UFOs that they saw as children, or I speak to alien abductees who've seen spirits in their homes and other beings around their bed. Here tonight are just a short selection of their paranormal events. Now, I know many of you out there have been seeing and experiencing strange activities since childhood. For some of you, it is consistent, and for others, it's sporadic. Sometimes weeks, months, years, and even decades can go by where there is no activity at all. And then one day, out of the blue, it happens again. Recently, I was contacted by a BBR member who has had experiences with several kinds of strange events over the years. He had seen a dark shadow figure in his new home on the first week the family moved in. He contacted me last week about an experience that day that had him really confused. I know many of you will have had the same experience, or one very similar enough that you may have an explanation for why this happened. Our witness is from the Midlands and he says last Wednesday on the 14th of July 2021, around four o'clock in the afternoon, I had to take a visit to my local shops, which are a short walk away. On the way, I had to stop to tie my lace and as they'd become loose, I bent down to tie them and as I did, I had the feeling I was being watched, which at the time was not unusual to be honest as I was on a main road. As I stood up and looked around, I happened to look up at an old house where there was an old lady that caught my attention from the upstairs window. She was standing there as plain as day and she was calling me with her hands to come to the house. I hesitated as she was a stranger, but what if she needed help? I didn't know what to do as she kept on calling me as if to say, come here, come to the door. I decided she probably needed help. So I started to walk down her garner path to the front door. And as I looked back up at the window, I noticed her walk away. I expected her to open the door. But when I got to the door and knocked on it, a different lady came to the door and said, yes, can I help you? I felt a bit awkward. And I was a little like, um, the old lady from upstairs window got my attention and asked me to come and knock on the door. The lady looked horrified as I explained. And she said, no, not at this house, I'm afraid. I think you've got the wrong house. I felt like I'd been stitched up here, so I took a few steps back and I pointed up to the window in question and I said, it was definitely in that window there. So she came towards me and she looked up and said, which window? So I pointed up again and she looked at me and was almost in tears and said, please just go away. I apologised and I walked away confused. I walked away thinking, what the, was all that about? I won't bother again. I had almost got to the bottom of the road when I heard a voice shouting excuse me coming from behind me. I turned around to see this chap walking towards me, asking me to wait. I thought he was going to start on me for knocking on the door and unsettling his wife. And this wasn't the case. At first he apologised for his wife's actions and he went on to explain to me that his mother-in-law, his wife's mother, had passed away several weeks ago. And the window I pointed at was in fact her bedroom, which he lived and passed away in. He asked if I knew this information or I knew the family and if it was a prank. I explained to him how I saw the old lady from the street and she called me to the door. Let's just say we had a good chat and went on our way. Now, anyone who has the gift will understand this man's dilemma. People presume having the ability to experience what others don't is a magical party trick. And in truth, it can be a huge burden to carry. It's not easy meeting people and suddenly hearing a message that you're urged to give them, you know, or seeing a person as you shop that others cannot. I once heard from a lady named Jill who lives in Grey Thurrock in Essex and she'd had an entire conversation with an elderly chap in a local cafe 
And they chatted about their love of dogs and how the chap was a little bit worried as he was waiting for his wife to arrive. She'd gone to the hairdressers, as she did every week, to have a haircut. They shared stories of their children until my friend realised she'd been sitting there so long her coffee had gone cold. Jill looked up in the hopes of catching the owner's eye for a refill when she realised everyone in the cafe was staring at her table. She turned to see if the chap saw this also and he was gone. He had simply vanished along with his teacup and saucer. Jill was really confused and thought at first it was some kind of cruel prank. The owner, at first, thought she was some kind of nut who'd been sitting talking to herself for over an hour. Jill explained about the old man who was sitting there when she first came in and sat down. And the cafe owner asked her to describe him and their conversation. When she did, the cafe owner explained the chap was called Frank Avis and he lived along the road from the cafe and he'd visit most mornings with his wife until she passed away. Then he would come alone and if anyone asked if he was waiting for someone, he would reply that he was waiting for his wife. Jill was completely overcome with a wave of sadness before complete confusion hit. She muttered her apologies and excuses. She got out of there as fast as her wobbling legs would allow. I know many of you, if not the exact same situation, I've also seen people that other people cannot see. I remember years ago in the early 90s I'd been out with a friend in the next town over and we had to walk home as we had no money and we'd been to a nightclub. I wasn't drunk but I'd say we were merry. I was walking back home on a route that took us along a road with a bridge on it uh, close to Wackles Hill Road in Salford and as we were walking we crossed the bridge and the street had old two-storey Victorian houses on both sides one grand, many of them now were rented by the room, so they kind of had a shared kitchen and a bathroom. Myself and my friend were walking on the left hand side of the street, and the houses had a small wall topped with a shallow iron railing that came to about four feet. There was a very short path, some grand stairs, and a very well tiled entryway. And at the bottom window, there was almost like a bay that had been formed. They also had cellars below them, but these were not inhabited. They were mostly for coal. And it was a warm night and we were just chatting as we walked along the road. Suddenly, I felt an awful feeling wash over me. It felt as if someone with a cold hand was tugging on my arm. Not around my arm, but inside my arm, around the bone. Before I could express this, I said out loud, Don't look right, to my friend. I knew, without knowing, how that there was a dead person in the chair in the front room of the house. I didn't know why I shouted it, but it did no good. Both myself and my friend looked right, and there was indeed an old woman. She was bluish grey, and she was just sitting there, with her head tilted onto her chest, in a kind of easy boy chair. She looked very old-fashioned, and she had a lace piece on her hair, and she just kind of fitted with the area of the houses. I didn't stop walking. And neither did my friend. We were both in such shock and we just kept going. But after a few hundred yards, my friend said, we've got to go back, we've got to ring the ambulance. I knew she was right, but I hated walking back. Even though the lady said was bowed, I could feel her eyes boring into me. I think it was her hand who pulled my arm from the inside. I think it was her. I don't know what she wanted. And I must explain, she wasn't a ghost or a spirit to me. She was a dead woman who'd been sitting there for years waiting to be seen. I pulled myself up straight and I just thought, get it over and done with Deb. We walked back to the house and we looked in the window and it looked very different. The chair she was sitting in was not there and neither was she. The house looked modern and correct for our era. The strange thing is, we never spoke about the incident again. And for the last 30 years, when asked, I've always said, no, I've never seen a ghost. I don't think she was a ghost, per se. I think she was a simulation of some kind. When I described the lady as blue, I mean the whole room had a bluish tinge to it, almost like a negative image in navy, but not black. The air seemed to fizzle or kind of bend around her. I don't know how to put it in words. Almost like a fish-eyed lens. That walk was one we did regularly, and it always took about 20 minutes tops, even when we were dawdling. 
That night, it took an hour and 20 minutes. And I forgot all about that experience many times over the years. But it would pop back into my mind, accompanied this kind of cold, clammy feeling. And I'd push it away as quickly as I could. My parents have both seen spirits on more than one occasion. My grandparents on both sides are the same. I don't understand the why and the how, but I think it runs in bloodlines. I also think anyone is capable of these abilities. I think they're naturally within us. They are an extra sense, and although extra, they are by far the most important. Listening to it and trusting it will save you many a bump in the road. Seeing things that do not appear to others is hard. Yet in some families, it is spoken about so regularly, it becomes almost mundane. Our next report comes from the other side of the more from me. Um, and it was sent in to me by a lady who's a listener. In 1970, my family member and her husband bought a large four-storey Victorian house. They managed to get it at quite a surprisingly low price for the size and location. The house had small woodlands behind it, which dropped down to the River Calder and the Calder Valley. She said, I spent a lot of my childhood there, but I never felt comfortable in the house. I loved spending time with my family. From the day she moved in, strange events started to happen. The first events I remember happened around a framed picture of a lady in Victorian attire that had been found in the cellar. She thought this might have been the original owner of the house and out of respect, she decided to hang it in the entrance hall. Well, no matter how many times she hung it up, it always ended up on the floor. Yet the string and the nail remained intact. Or when she hung the picture straight, it would be found lopsided. And no matter how many times it fell, surprisingly, the glass never broke. Once I visited with my sister and our mum and I remember Mum calling up the stairs for her to come downstairs, but she was getting no response. Mum shouted, What are you doing up there? And the next thing that happened was my sister came out of the downstairs room. My mum looked really confused and said, I've just seen a girl run across the top of the stairs in a red skirt. My sister was wearing jeans at the time. My older sister, who owned the house, said she'd seen the girl a few times before. Just flashes of her out of the corner of her eye and only ever upstairs. And at this point, I have to mention, my older sister was always very sensitive to spirit and nothing fazed her. She often spent weeks on her own there as her husband worked, took him away to, out of the country a lot. They did quite a lot of improvements on the house over the years when they lived there. One improvement was raising the floor in the main room to try and make it warmer, try and reduce the size of the room. The room was always cold. One night, my sister was sitting in there reading when she suddenly saw half, yes, half of a lady who was carrying a tea tray wearing a mop cap as she glided across the floor through the lounge and out into the kitchen. All she could see of this lady was the torso from the waist up. My sister jumped up and followed her into the kitchen, but the lady had gone. My sister reckoned she was walking on the level of the old stone floor that was there before the renovations and that's why she could only see her top half. Now there were six bedrooms upstairs in the house but only two in use. One was the master bedroom and the other one I stayed in with another of our sisters but I would never sleep in that room on my own. Every night our blankets would be pulled off us by unseen forces and our feet would be tickled. We even heard a child laughing. At this time, nothing bad ever happened. It was just strange. The room at the end of the corridor always scared me the most. And when her cat had kittens, they were always going into this room. So of course, I found myself in there more often than not. I'd always put my shoe by the door to make sure it didn't close on me. There was just something about that room that wasn't nice. The far corner of the room always seemed darker than the rest. One of the kittens was sitting one day staring at that corner and I went in to retrieve it. The bloody door slammed shut on me. I screamed blue murder, I couldn't open it. I was shouting and crying to my sister, convinced she was holding the door handle on the other side, when it suddenly opened and I legged it out of there screaming. As I passed the landing window, I saw my sister outside in the garden. 
My older sister tried telling me that the door was just pronged to sticky. But years later, she admitted that she'd lied about that. My shoe that I put in the gap of the door was nowhere to be found. And I had to get two buses home with one shoe and one slipper on. And we never did find it. Another strange event that happened to my sister was when she was 16. She was staying over at my older sister's house with mum. And our mum found her standing at the window, which was two floors up. And below was a cobbled path that led into the woodlands. She was in some sort of trance with tears rolling down her cheeks. Mum had to shake her to get her to respond. And she said to mum she had an urge to jump out of the window. My older sister did some research and she found out that a young girl had sadly killed herself at the house about 80 years earlier. She died after leaping out of that very window. So many other things happened at the house, just so many others. Far too many to list here. After too many events, my sister and her family finally had enough of the house and they just decided to sell it. A week before they were due to move, my sister suffered a slip disc and she was on bed rest for the next six weeks. So the sale fell through. The second time they found a buyer, once again, a week before the move, her husband lost control of his car in an accident. He ended up wrapping the car around a lamppost and he broke both of his legs. As you can imagine, the sale fell through. The third time they tried to sell it, a pipe burst flooding the master bedroom. My sister reckoned the house refused to let them leave. As the house had servants' quarters that were empty and were never used, they decided to have building work done to split it into two houses and they sold the upper part whilst they still lived in the bottom half. I had a look on the map, she said, and the house is still there now. Two front doors at the top, so it's probably two four-storey homes now. She asked, I wonder if the owners still have paranormal events? I'm sure the home had a whole array of energies moving around and seeing in there. I think the ladies in this family have inbuilt abilities. They tune into the world around them in a way that some others cannot. They're all used to experiencing the strange and the unknown. They may have been the first people to experience activity at their house, but I did wonder why the house was so cheap and just stood empty. It is impossible to find property in the colder valley. It's one of our areas of natural beauty. It is beautiful. It's a timeless place to live. The property is usually snatched up within seconds of it going on the market. I've seen some old barns that fell into ruins years ago that sell for five and six figures due to the land that they're built on. Or those old barns are converted into holiday lets or holiday homes because they get an awful lot of money for them. Luckily, in the end, the family were able to find a buyer and they sold up and they moved. I think the events probably followed the family members at their new houses, though, I'll be honest. People often ask me why they live in so many haunted homes. Sometimes it's not the home that's haunted, per se. More the inhabitant of the home. Some people live in a series of haunted homes without ever thinking that it is them themselves that are the catalyst when the events start to happen. Their ability to be able to see hear or experience the world around them as others don't, help them tune in quickly to any place, home or building. I've experienced a series of weird events over the years and yet I never put two and two together. It was only when I sat down to write my first book, I made a list of every weird or strange event that I could remember since childhood. And over the years you remember more and the list becomes longer. Our first witness was just walking to the shop when he saw the old woman at the window. He could have just walked on by and never had that experience. Was it meant for him to see? Or was he the first person the old lady could actually interact with that had walked by? There'll be an answer to this question, but sometimes we never find it out. It's not meant for us, perhaps. We just have to accept that. I think this was the old lady's way of showing her daughter she was okay and still around, happily watching the world go by from the window as she did in life. Another report that mentions an old lady says, when I was five or six, my mama and I lived in my grand's council house with our extended family. Decades before I was born, my gran and granddad lived there for years with nine children 
and at times a few grandchildren and my great-grandmother. My great-grandmother had passed away more than 10 years before I was born. And when my mama was quite young, mama and I shared a large back room which doubled up as a sitting room, playroom. One night I was sleeping in my bed facing my toy cupboard which had no door but a really pretty sheet which Mama had painted and nailed onto the frame of the cupboard. I remember suddenly opening my eyes to see a little old lady standing in the doorway of my toy cupboard. I wasn't scared, which in itself was slightly strange, as I felt that the old lady was familiar to me and she was safe. She just appeared to be a regular little old lady with a slightly strange set of clothes. Without moving her mouth, she said, It's okay, pet. I've just come to see how you are. Go back to sleep. The words sounded clear in my head. And being five or six, I said, okay. And I went back to sleep. The next day I was playing in the garden with Mama. And I asked her about what I said was the strange dream. Mama, who was very close to her grandmother, asked me to describe the little old lady. And I did. Mama looked a little strange and then changed the subject. Years later, we were talking about family with my other cousin Jimmy who were living with Mama and I at the time. Mama then told me that when I described that little old lady, I'd actually described my great grandmother. Jimmy laughed and said when he stayed in the same bedroom, he'd seen our great our great grandmother in the same place that I'd seen her. Jimmy laughed and he said when he'd stayed in the same bedroom, he'd also seen our great grandmother in the same place that I'd seen her. But there were three differences. Jimmy knew our great grandmother before she passed. And although he was very young, he did remember her well. And it happened in the middle of the day. And she just smiled at him without speaking. I still wasn't sure. So my mama got out a really old looking family photo. Sure enough, in the middle of the family members I knew was the very same kindly looking old lady. The visits that we've listened to from people and their relatives today are confusing, you know, muddling, upsetting, sometimes shocking, but not malevolent in any way. But I don't think that can be said about our next report. When we moved to Nottingham in the early 2000s, I was swapping scary stories with my stepfather's nephew, Joe, who lived on the same suburban estate as me. The estate overlooks the River Trent, and close by there is an old colliery mine, long since closed down, a graveyard and a natural water spring, plus some other local landmarks that will be soon become somewhat pivotal to the story. He says, so here's Joe and me. He's 20 odd years ago now, and we couldn't have been older than 19. He's a typical local tar- character. He's reliable, likeable and earnest. We're swapping scary stories and I told him about an incident at our previous address. A rather stand ghost story, really. Joe seemed impressed and then he volunteered a story of his own. Something he is certain must have been a particular vivid nightmare and not a real event. Because, of course, how could it be? How could it be real? A thing like that, so frightening, so awful to behold. It remains imprinted in your memory to this day. Joe explained that he saw the frozen image of a monstrous face, an impossible horror, outside in the dark, and it was peering through the window at him with its bloated dead eyes. It was inhuman, is probably the most accurate description he would give. He said it had a bulbous, swollen head, and its face was grotesquely distorted. It was, at the time, pressed shockingly close to the glass. Did it not seem to care that he could see it? He told me, I got up to fetch a glass of water from the kitchen late one night. I turned on the light and it was just there. It didn't feel like I was dreaming. It felt real, but I must have been dreaming. Joe dropped his empty glass. It fell to the floor, but it didn't break. He said his hand flew to his mouth. And instinctively, he's trying to stifle his scream and he can feel that it's coming and he knows it'll wake up his mum and dad. Did this thing know that he was coming? Was it waiting at the window for him? Had it waited there for him? How could it know? Why was it pressing all of its awfulness against the window like that? 
it, it's showing him itself. It's showing itself to him. It's wants him to see it. And he's screaming now. He's backed up against the wall. His hands are holding onto his face as if to cover his eyes. But he don't quite dare, not until it's gone. He's no longer trying to hold this terror inside. He's screaming. From upstairs, he hears footsteps thundering across the landing. Mum and Dad are coming. And it's gone. There's nothing there. He was adamant that it was just a nightmare. It had not felt that way at the time. It seemed like he was awake. How it was just there in the window looking at him with its eyes like stone was his question. Like it was at the most natural thing in the world for it to be there. I asked him, could it have been a prank, do you think? Like some, you know, knobhead in a mask. He shook his head and he told me this was at the back of the house. He had kind of like suburban fencing, dead bolts on the gates and all that. Late at night, no one could get back there without the whole house knowing. In the shape of its head, he said, it wasn't any kind of mask. It had a wide dome of a forehead and it had eyes that appeared swollen shut. It had wrinkles and creases, like a scuffed boot. It had a sloped mouth, the thin, long lips sealing a very heavy, solemn jaw. And here's what I wanted to say to him. Mate, I don't think it was a dream. I know he frightened you. I know how terrible he was to look at, but he didn't want to hurt you. Likely he could have, if he wanted to. He could have been lonely or curious or both. Maybe he needed help. I think that's why they do this kind of thing, revealing themselves, as does happen from time to time. I wanted to say, mate, I think maybe you saw something amazing. I'm not sure if I would class that as benevolent um it was clearly pressed up against the window so that you could see it and i think it was there so that it would terrify you but that's just my honest opinion um a few months ago i was asked to chat with the ufo interest group about some of the reports i have taken from up but teas and witnesses to strange beings or crafts and it was a zoom call the chat went well and because i understand how hard it can be introducing the subjects that i do to a new audience I always leave a good amount of time at the end for questions. I invariably find a person in the audience who's had an experience with the paranormal of their own. And that's how I came across the next report. One chap asked me if, had anyone ever reported seeing a gargoyle to you? And I had to admit that I did not have any accounts of gargoyles, but I was really interested to hear his experience. He said the gentleman and his wife had been to visit Glastonbury Abbey and as they walked the grounds there, there were other visitors milling around and the gentleman explained that he saw out the corner of his eye that there was something unusual sitting in the corner. From what he could make out, it seemed to be a strange hunched figure. The gentleman did a double take and to make sure he was not mistaken, he turned to a visitor beside him and asked the lady if she could see what he was seeing and she replied that she could. They both saw a small leather-skinned gargoyle, which was crouching almost out of sight in the corner of the grounds. It looked as real as real, and it was clearly not a prop or an art installation, he said. It was a little leather-skinned gargoyle, and it was sat watching as people walked by. Now let's move across the country and hear more of these wonderful accounts. I will take you to another ancient site that is still visited by thousands of people each year. Set on the Yorkshire coast, there is a lovely town known as Whitby, and it's famous for its Gothic Abbey. A hot spot for tourists and ghost hunters alike due to the many paranormal events that are reported in the area. Our next witness has lived in the town for most of their life, and they've had a number of strange occurrences. One of them was at the Church of St Mary. Now, the Church of St Mary was founded around 1110 AD, for anybody who wants to know, and it's situated on the town's east cliff. So it overlooks the mouth of the River Esk and it runs into the sea. There are numerous headstones and tombstones, many of them weathered by the elements, and but they cover several centuries. It's a really nice place if you get the chance to go. So landed gentry and ordinary folk, sailors, fishermen, all of their resting place in St Mary's. It's a location at the top of 199 steps, which means it's quite an effort to carry a coffin up to its final resting place, although wealthy families could use a horse and carriage to go up the track. The witness said, my experience 
occurred in 1989 in St Mary's Graveyard on the East Cliff. I was there with a group of friends and we were all around 15 years of age at the time. I remember there was about eight of us all together that night. There was no alcohol or drugs involved at any point. We were local kids just wandering around and chatting. On this night, we were on our way up the 199 steps. When we got about halfway up the steps, we could see a white cat that was sitting there. I went to stroke it, but it hissed at me. So I took the hint and I left it alone. And we continued upwards, past our furry little omen. At the top of the steps, we split into two groups. One group hid while the other group searched. A sort of hide and seek. When we'd been playing for around 30 minutes, there was only one friend left to find. Myself and a mate were looking together on the seaward facing side of the church. I stepped over a laid down gravestone and I caught my foot on it and I tripped over. When I regained my feet and stood up, I first noticed what we thought was our missing friend. They were there, crouched down in a ball about 70 yards away from us. We could make out just a black shape that we thought at the time was just our mate. We walked towards the dark shape, talking to each other and not really paying the shape any mind. That was until we were about five or six feet away from it. And when we both stopped and turned to look at it closely, it changed shape. It animated into the death figure, you know, the death one that you see, but it didn't have a size. It was well over six feet tall and it was made up of pure darkness, an absolute void. It seemed to be made of antimatter. There was no light reflecting off it. Even though it was night time, there is a lamp post at the end of the graveyard near the boundary wall. And there are lights highlighting the church and also the lights from the arcades across the harbour far below. In less than half a second, myself and my friend had turned tail and scarpered along the cliff back towards the main body of the church where all of our friends were gathered, including our mate who we were recently looking for. We quickly told them what had happened and we stood away from the church to get a better look along the path and our dark companion had followed us and had halved the gap between us. It had moved from where me and my mate had first seen it, and that was about 100 yards from when we were standing. Now, all of our friends got a good look at it, as it was about five, uh, 50 yards at this point away from us. We turned in unison and ran down the 199 steps as fast as we could, and we just ran off home. Wherever you travel in the UK, you will find an area that is reportedly haunted. We have a rich history and some of our oldest buildings date back to the first century BC. People have walked our lands for thousands of years, each leaving energy as they went. In every town, city or village, there are local tales handed down through the centuries as well. And also more recent modern day reports. There are many regional names for popular spooks such as Ginny Green Teeth and the Pluckley Howler and old red clogs, each place having a story to share, each family or friends group sharing their personal reports over the years with each other. One area in England is well known for the ghosts of a murderous young girl named Sally in the wood. Many locals say that the birds in the woods can't sing and the woods remain ominously quiet. Sally lures unsuspecting motorists to their deaths in fatal accidents. Now, Sally is said to be the ghost of a local gypsy girl who was locked up in the 18th century in a place called Brown's Folly. It's kind of a tower, a stone tower. She'd been seen for decades by locals and visiting folk who were driving through the area. Sally is said to scream in the woods at night and disturb motorists as they drive by. And just outside the city of Bath, you'll find a road which many locals are reluctant to drive down, especially at night. The road cuts through Brown's Folly, a patch of woodland that is haunted by the ghost of the murdered girl. Locked up without food and water, she was just left there to die. Our witness said, I was 19 when this event happened, and I've never forgotten it. It was a very up-close personal encounter, and as real as real could be, and it still affects me to this day. And honestly, it scared the living crap out of me for days. It was around 6am, or even a little bit earlier, and I was driving from the city of Bath to Bradford-on-Avon. I was driving on the road that goes through the forest. I was on my way to work. And I saw a woman stranded by the roadside. I slowed from 60 miles an hour to nearly 10. 
As I thought this woman needed help or a lift as she was stranded. There are no houses really for miles around and she was walking on my side of the road on the left and there are no paths and the road's deadly for pedestrians. She was pushing a look being out there like that. As far as I was aware, she was an ordinary woman in a really dangerous part of the road. I thought she was going to run out in front of the car. I slowed down, I got a really good look at her and I looked def- directly into her eyes and I used that term loosely. I was only about five feet away from her and she was ghoulish with blood covered skin. And I sped off with my foot on the floor shouting, oh, oh, etc. She was horrific to look at. I looked in my rear view mirror seconds later and she was gone. She was nowhere to be seen. The details of her face were quite honestly horrific. There are many reported fatalities on that road from car accidents. I'm not sure if it was Sally in the wood or an echo of a deceased woman, but my God, the experience affected me for weeks after, he says. The vision was just bloody and very graphic, and she seemed as solid as you and I, until I passed her. I was so shocked, I went back home, and I took the day off work. Now, our next report comes from Gold Hill, North Carolina, and it's a childhood memory about a strange creature with red eyes who would be seen in a child's bedroom at night. Gold Hill is also an area where there are many hauntings and paranormal happenings deep within the mines that are to be found all over the area and also in the historical buildings, some of which are the same today as they were back then. Gold Hill, North Carolina, as I said, uh, this is where the report comes from. And the witness says, I've had a lot of weird things happen in my life. Most of them I don't remember at all. They are totally blacked out. My middle sister can't understand why I don't remember these events, as I'm the one who fought off a lot of what happened to protect her. She, the poor thing, has never been able to forget a single detail. This particular event I want to share with you happened about 35 years ago, just after I turned 14. It did not involve my sister for once. I talked to her about it probably about 10 years ago, and she had no idea of anything odd that had happened at that house. My father was a preacher and we moved every other year, sometimes even more frequently. We had just moved from a homeless situation into a new home. We're still there now, but the buildings at that location have changed a lot. The configuration isn't really that important, just that our house was closer to the graveyard than any of the other buildings. And there was woods besides and behind the house, which were much closer to the buildings back then. When we first moved in, there were some neighbours in a little old mobile home on the property just to the south of the house. Their site was really run down, lots of old appliances and crap surrounding it. It was situated inside the trees in a small clearing that was visible from my southern window. My room was on the southwest corner of the house with large double windows looking south and another set looking west, overlooking the southern end of the playground. The graveyard and western windows never bothered me, except when there were critters foraging around in the trash cans under my window. That was merely annoying. The southern windows, though, were very different. In that mobile home lived a man and a woman who, it seemed to me now, were probably on drugs. They had a couple of large, terrifying, vicious dogs on seriously heavy chains. They'd never gotten loose, as far as I know, but they terrified me. I was sure one particular dog was going to come crashing through my window in the night. I was absolutely convinced of it. It was a deep feeling of knowing it was inevitable. It never happened, of course. I have no idea what breeds they were. They were just huge and they were mean. And they were probably abused and certainly neglected. Somehow, very soon after we moved in, my dad had the people kicked out and all the stuff cleaned off the land. It must have belonged to the church or I don't think he would have gotten it done so quickly. One day, they were there, the next, everything was gone. The speed and finality was a little frightening. We never saw those people or their dogs again. It didn't matter. I was still very unhappy about the area and never even looked over there if I could help it. Every single evening, before sundown, I would shut my big, heavy drapes, very snugly. Not one gap anywhere, ever. And I did not open them again until well after daylight. There was also a small closet on the southeast corner of the room. 
that I was vaguely unhappy about, but for no real reason. I never had childhood fears of closets, you know, just the witch under the bed when I was really small. And I have no idea where that came from. We didn't have a television set for most of my growing up years. I never saw stuff like that or heard scary stories of that nature. We never went to anyone's house because we were always the new kids and we moved away again by the time we started making connections. So there was no influence from other kids at school. And nothing like that was ever talked about at church. That witch under the bed fear had long since faded. I don't know why I mentioned the closet because nothing ever happened to it. It's just part of my memories of that room. Although, now that I think about it, when I first saw that black thing, it was at the corner of the bed, closest to that closet. The parsonage was a four-bedroomed house, and it was old, but it was fairly spacious. None of the rest of the house had a weird feeling to me, just my room. And even then, only at night, my double bed was placed under the western set of windows, so the southern ones were on my right. One night, after we were all moved in and unpacked and those neighbours were gone, I just settled into bed when, for some reason, I opened my eyes. I looked over at the footboard. For no reason I was aware of. I heard no sounds. I had no feeling. I just looked. I just opened my eyes and I looked. And there, moving slowly, from the right to the left, and then back again, was a dark, flat shape with glowing red eyes. It made no noise and it didn't have a smell. It looked two-dimensional, like it was flat, but somehow I was aware it had depth and substance. My room was very dark with the lights off and I didn't have a nightlight, but the darkness of this prowling thing was unlike any black I'd ever seen before or since. The shape was like a hyena or a very, very large raccoon. It had that weird humped up back and their heads hunched below the shoulders. The glowing red eyes were like large glowing coals. They glowed, but they didn't emit light. They did not illuminate anything, not even any part of this thing's face. And they were very large for the size of its head. Weirdly, I couldn't discern any difference between the head and the body. I just knew how it would be if I was to see it. There were no features to the head and the face of the body just the outline of the whole shape and those two eyes. It was not furry, it just kind of smooth outline shape of what I interpreted to be at the time, a dog thing. It seemed canine to me, but for no reason that I can pinpoint. It may have been down to my well-established childhood fear of dogs. I don't know how long I sat there watching it. I didn't feel anything, no fear, no panic. One second I was looking at it, the next I was flying up and over my bed to reach the light switch on the wall in the front of my bed. I jumped in one movement from my bed over the top of the footboard and I hit the switch as I landed. I never ever turned that light off again. I didn't sleep at night the whole two years we lived there. I would stuff a towel under the door so my dad wouldn't see the light on if he came down to check on things. I sat at my desk and I painted all night long every single night we lived there after that. I've never been so artistically productive before or since. And once we left that place, I had no trouble sleeping. Even as we lived there, even as I did my nightly routine of gathering my paints and water and stuffing the towel under the door, I never gave that dog shadow thing a second thought. I never thought of it again, but I never trusted the dark in that room either. And it was gone from my mind like it had never happened. But it changed everything for me while we lived there. And it was years and years later when I thought about that thing again. I would like to make this clear. I do not think it was a demon, as I understand what people mean when they say that word. I don't know what it was, but I don't believe in those kind of embodiment of evil from hell. As best as I can figure, it was something tied to the land. Why it only affected my room, I don't know. There is something else I just remembered whilst I was writing about the red-eyed dog thing. It had been a one-rule schoolhouse, which had probably also been in the original church, and it was right behind our home and my bedroom. 
between my room and the graveyard. We could still see the outline of part of the foundation at below ground level. An old man at the church told me once that when he was a kid, he'd gone to school and he'd seen that it burned down in the night. He went home and he was whipped for telling his father a lie about the school burning down. His father found out later that it was true, of course, and I don't know if they made amends, but that schoolhouse, right at the corner of my bedroom, it once burned down and it was never rebuilt on the land. So now I wonder if this black thing was something attached to the land. In my own thinking, not backed up by any research I've done specific to the area, there's a very good chance it had something to do with the original inhabitants of the area who were driven off by European immigrants. In the last 15 years or so, I've heard of the word shook. I'm still unclear exactly what's meant by that. And up until then, I'd never heard of anything like the black thing before. I knew the Bible stories about demons, of course, being a preacher's kid, but I'd never really given them any thought. They were as realistic to me as Snow White. Just a story. I didn't grow up with images of gargoyles or creepy old paintings of hell and demon and grotesque stained windows. The churches my dad preached in were modern and kind of sneered at those kind of things. So this was not part of my world or my thinking. Weirdly at the time, we did have background superstitions of demons and stuff, but they were just something to have a theatrical nervousness about, that's all. So I had absolutely no idea what that black thing was. I'm sure that helped me deal with it. And if I'd already had a name for it and a fear of it, I'd probably been reduced to a blubbering mess I could never have recovered from. It never occurred to me even to mention it to my parents. They would have thought I was just trying to get attention. I couldn't tell my sisters because I was the oldest. And no way I was going to freak them out, especially when I had no answers and no way of getting in it. So I just painted at night. I dragged myself to school. I crashed in the afternoon and I painted all night and the next night for two years. The way we left that place was humiliating. The church board kicked my dad out, but it was a relief to be gone. I would like to thank our witnesses for allowing us to share their experiences. Without their brave testaments, these reports would just be lost to obscurity. I am certain that there are others out there who have witnessed very similar events. I'd like to leave you with the questions. Why do certain people seem to attract more than their fair share of activity? And are those events engineered in some way? Or is it the person themselves that is the key catalyst that sets off the unexplained occurrences? I'm just not sure. I've had events myself that at the time I wouldn't have cast them as ghostly or paranormal in any way. But when I look back now, that's probably the best way to describe them. Supernatural. Just there's no word really to fit it into. There's no box that makes it convenient. You see and experience incredibly strange things and other people around you don't see them or hear them or, you know, or feel them. It's really hard. But as we've now seen tonight, that there are lots and lots of people like that out there. Not everybody is alone. There are many, many, many of us. And I know that there will be many of us listening tonight. If you would like to get involved with BBR and help us investigate the cases, or you have a case that you'd like to report yourself, you can get in touch with me via my email address. And you can find that in the description below. Good night, everyone.